Yes, sir. Uh, next question. Hi, good evening. Um, in light of postmodernism and an escape from anything absolute and concrete, um, and also in uh, reference to the uh, revelation, where do you see America heading in the next stage, in the next 20 or 30 years? So where this is going to go, I think it's a mood. It's a mood that is presently convenient. You'll find out you cannot redefine reality and baptize it in any way you wish. Reality will stare at you in the face whether you like it or not. Death is death. Life is life. When you love somebody, you know the reality in your own heart. All of these things will impinge upon your sensitivities, and so postmodernism will be a convenient tool for those who want to escape reality. Postmodernism didn't begin in the 20th century. It began at the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve, when the Satan said, has God really said? Did God really speak? You redefine it in your own terms. So I think it'll ultimately always be there in little specks and blobs and so on. But the reality is it'll only be an escape hatch. It'll never define ultimate reality for us. What does that mean? Two or three things. The church will have to understand what truth means and proclaim it and proclaim Christ in his most attractive form. <laughs> Secondly, we have to start understanding that many people who come into our churches are already hurting. We don't hurt them anymore. We, we plunge our hands into raw wounds when people come. One of the biggest churches in the country has just released its study. It came out last week. It's in my hand. The pastor of that large, huge church that set the mold for many others, I won't even use the terms, said it rocked him to his boots when he saw the results. He said, I had an option either to not disclose this or to disclose it. He said, to disclose this is hurting me, but not to disclose it would hurt us more. And basically, it says there that the people who've come there now for 20 years have not grown in depth and want something greater and deeper than just trying to be relevant when they come there. The church is a community, and it's hard work. You know, Jeff and I often talk, and he'll often rib me about something intellectual or so, and you know, he'll refer, de deprecate himself in some way. And I've said to Jeff, I said, Jeff, you're a genius. I said, you're a genius, and I mean that. He's able to turn a phrase, he's able to take a moment and make it make, you need to be a genius to understand reality and then caricature it. We are all gifted in certain ways, we're all ignorant in different subjects. So my challenge to you is we all need each other and we need to be a community. Postmodernism still longs for community. And that's where the church is gonna be. Read well, study hard, Ultimately, the questions will come, and postmodernism will only be an escape hatch. It will not be a reality at the end of the day. Rationalism came, existentialism came, empiricism came. All these isms and schisms will come and go, but the word abides forever, and I think the church will do that. Thank you. I hope we're recording this. You did hear that, Mom, didn't you? <laughs> Next question. Thank you so much. My name is Ruth Mahatra. I'm a student here at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And my question is, I was wondering if you could comment on the state of higher education in America and also what we as Christians can do to confront the increasing threats to freedom, um, to speak the truth and religious liberty on college campuses today. Um, let me just say a couple of things about uh, what is this happening in Europe, because we may be slightly ahead of you on this. Uh, so, for example, in France, it is illegal to have a religious meeting on campus of any university. Three or more students gathered in a room is an illegal meeting, so they can't even have prayer triplets. So you have prayer doubles, or if you're bipolar, you're on your own, but... <laughs> you, you, so... 
I shouldn't have said that. That was. <laughs> it's Jeff. He's a bad influence. <laughs> Actually, Jeff, you may notice that my seat is not only warm but slightly damp, and I'll. <laughs> 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 this really is going to be my last RCIM engagement, isn't it? Now, the situation is different in Europe. We've, we've had a huge belief in the value of education in Europe for a very long time, which is why it's been free. And it's only recently that even at universities like Oxford and Cambridge and the University of Paris and so on, where you've actually had to pay to go. Um, now, they have began to have to change that slightly, um, and they do charge for it. I, I, myself, have been opposing that idea. It was at Oxford University where um, uh, sorry, at Cambridge, where one of the, uh, a guy called Wittgenstein, who was the youngest professor of philosophy ever to be appointed in, the, appointed in the history of the university, he said this to his students. He said, it is my job to move you from believing in disguised nonsense to believing in patent nonsense. In other words, what he was saying was, everything is nonsense. Everything. Nothing makes any sense. But that fact is disguised from you. But after three years of doing a philosophy degree at the University of Cambridge, you will graduate with a degree in patent nonsense. Everything is nonsense, but you'll know it's nonsense. And that's why I'm opposed to university fees. I mean, why pay to get a degree in nonsense? It doesn't seem to make any sense. <laughs> now, because that kind of thinking has sort of been militarized now right across Europe, uh, hence why we have this incredible opposition. Um, and so, for example, another one of Richard Dawkins' statements is that no, ox no professor at university should be allowed to teach if he believes in God. He went on to say that anyone who questions the idea of atheistic evolution should be expelled from the campus, our campus, where I'm also on the faculty. One of my colleagues, John Lennox, stood up and said, excuse me, when I was trained as a scientist, we were told to question everything. Are there now some things which are beyond reach, uh, which are going to have to be addressed? So I think these have become very crucial issues. But let me just reiterate something that Ravi said about freedom, where he said freedom is not free. Let me just try to explain that. Freedom is not doing whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want to. That is not freedom. That is anarchy. Anarchy and societies that are ruled by anarchy are marked out by a loss of freedom, not by the multiplication or the gain of it. Freedom is a moral concept. It only exists within a moral framework, which is why after the Declaration of American Independence was signed, Samuel Rutherford, who was one of the signatories to that declaration, said that a nation, once it is equally poised, must either preserve its virtue or lose its liberty. That a nation, once it is equally poised, it's in the balance, either preserves its virtue or loses its liberty. Because freedom is a moral concept. It only exists within a moral framework. What has happened within the West is we have replaced a positive view of freedom with a negative view of freedom. A negative view of freedom is characterized by the absence of constraint. Okay. No form of external constraint whatsoever. But the perfect model of this type of freedom would be a spaceman floating aimlessly in space, free of any form of external constraint, yet powerless to move. And our societies have become increasingly powerless. The opposite model of freedom would be a positive model of freedom. If that spaceman wants to move, he has to make contact with an external reality outside of himself against which he can push off. And that external reality is God. God gave us freedom. He gave us a moral framework to protect and preserve that freedom. Unless we preserve both that framework and both him, we don't have an increase of freedom. We have a loss of it. And that's the message I think we need to be taking to our campuses up and down the country and also in this country. And my prayer for America is the land which is known as the land of the free won't end up losing its liberty because it didn't also understand that it had to preserve its virtue. But it's a very, it's a very powerful question. We simply need to take on the, some of this bad philosophy and just expose the fact that it's actually not very good. Someone wants to find a philosopher as a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. <laughs> and um, given the current state of play, I, I can understand why that's becoming increasingly increasingly uh, a popular conviction. And what we simply need to do is explain what the very nature of freedom is itself and why we enjoy the ac academic freedoms that we enjoy that we wouldn't enjoy in any other kind of university system almost anywhere in the world. 
and help understand that those are some of the things that actually make us great and we have to be prepared to make a stand for those things if we want to keep the kind of society that we have taken the ground for granted for so long. But it's a good question and now I'll let the master and I'll go and sit on the dry seat over here. <laughs> Lee Strobel, the writer, was ribbing me once. He, he was talking with me and he said, I blame you for my son going into philosophy. I said, why? He said, he was just heading along in another direction. Then he came and spoke at a set of meetings and he switched his majors, becoming a philosopher. He said, so I called my son and I said, do you know the difference between a professor of philosophy and a large pizza? And he said, my son looked at me, he said, Dad, is this a trick question? He said, do you know the difference between a professor of philosophy and a large pizza? He said, what's the answer, Dad? He said, a large pizza can feed a family of four. <laughs> you know what? We don't like to pay our dues of thinking. And now when we are attacked in every direction, we need to raise up students who may need to learn how to think. You know, Jesus talked to lawyers. He talked to people with leprosy. He talked to people who'd blown it big time. He always got to the nerve of their question and then touched their heart. I would say, as tough as it is on the campus, I can speak for our ministry, we cannot handle over 90% of our invitations that come to us. Cannot. If a university writes to me today in America, it could be years before I even get there because we are so committed for years to come. So you pray for people who are on the campuses doing the work in the Bible studies and the other little groups and for those of us who go in as apologists and try to light a match under them. University is leaving people empty. I'll close with this. When I began at Oxford University in July, Michael organized some meetings and they moved us to the biggest auditorium. When I was at uh, uh, Staten Island, College of Staten Island last week, they moved us from a small room to, the, to, a much, to a much bigger auditorium there. The opening day that I was to begin my lectures in the afternoon and the morning, a story broke on Balliol College campus that the president of the student body, what is he, 21 or 22, something like that? 21 years old, president of the student body, Balliol College, had taken his life. When I was halfway through my talk, I referred to it and I said, I know exactly what drove him to that because when I was 17, that's where I was on a bed of suicide. I said, all your education is not going to give you meaning. It's only going to express your meaninglessness in more sophisticated terminology. And I said, you want meaning? You're going to have to find it in that which is transcendingly true and find that relationship with God. You know, they were lined up. Michael will tell you they were lined up along the halls at the end of that talk. I don't know the number of students who came and said they were struggling with the same ideas and deep-seated problems. You've got to find the moment where the university student is transparent and they will open up. You be the salt and you be the light. You'll be shocked in the years to come how many lives you've actually touched just by the way you've lived and reflected his splendor and the value for others. Thank you. Maybe we'll take, maybe we'll take one more question, maybe. And one more question, maybe. Thank you. I have many Muslim friends from uh, all over the world. Uh, they come to this country. Uh, they love the freedom of worship, the freedom of education they get. Uh, even in Turkey, you can wear a hijab while you're at the university. Uh, one of the things that comes to point always is they consider America a model Islamic country. And you made the claim that Islam wouldn't be able to create a country as the United States. How would one defend that position? With great ease. <laughs> With great ease. Are you a Muslim yourself? No, I was. No, okay, go on. With great ease. Recently, the king of Arabia, the king of Saudi Arabia, gave $10 million to Harvard University and $10 million to Georgetown to open up chairs of Islamic studies for the sake of understanding Islam and 
creating more understanding. I think it's a great idea. If they've got the money and want to do it, great idea. The New York Times journalist said to, said to him in January 1 issue of um, 2006, she looked at him and said, so understanding is what you see? He said, yes. Are you going to open a chair of Christian studies in Saudi Arabia? He said, no, we don't have any Christians in Saudi Arabia. She said, isn't that the point? If you want people to understand one another and you don't understand the Christian worldview, why do you want the Christian to understand the Muslim worldview? He said, that's not what our donation is all about. We are here to create chairs of Islamic studies. Harvard took it, Georgetown took it. They've got chairs of Islamic studies. Where I, we are at Oxford is the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies, one of the greatest of which Prince Charles is a patron. Fair enough. Why is it that no Islamic country that I know of, like Iran, Malaysia, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, and even Iraq, and even in a moderate country like Turkey, what happened in Turkey recently? The brutal, torturous murder of four people, one or two of whom were tortured for an hour or so. You read that story. Where is the government? Where is the outcry in the media in those places? There was a little bit of this, a little bit of that. If when I was in Bethlehem, Israel, I was writing my book, The Prophet and the Priest, Jesus, uh, Prince and the Prophet, Jesus Talks to Muhammad, which will be released posthumously. It's, in, it's ready and they're all in a lock and key. <clears throat> <clears throat> because I'm not yet ready to sign my will. Uh, <laughs> because where there's a will, there are lots of relatives. Uh, <clears throat> I was talking to this professor of Islamic studies it's a candid conversation, and I spent some time with the Grand Mufti, my videographer, Bob Tigert, who's here managing all of this. He was with me. So I go to this professor of Islamic studies, and I say to him, the Quran says there's no compulsion in religion. He said, that is correct. I said, if your daughter, I pointed to his daughter's picture on the, on the desk there, I said, if she became a Christian, what would you do? He didn't bat an eyelid. He looked at me and said, I'd kill her. I said, you'd kill her? He said, yes. I said, you would personally kill your daughter? He said, let me put it this way. I will put every, do everything in my power to keep her from making that change. But then I will turn her over to the authorities and they will have to do the execution, but I will have her killed. I said, so there is compulsion in religion. There's no freedom to disbelieve. There are people in Malaysia today who were misidentified as birth according to parentage and were listed as followers of Islam who are now asking to be removed from that because one of them is a Buddhist from a Buddhist family. You may have followed that case. He doesn't even have the right to go to court to ask for the rightful claim of his own parents' religion. So if Islam wants to be seen as on a par with America where there's freedom to disbelieve, then it should give its citizens the freedom to disbelieve as well. I've spoken about this at the highest level to ministers of religion and so on, and I'll say this on the positive side. I'm grateful to God that they've given me the honor of speaking there many times. I've been to some places I can't even publicly mention to you, and Michael has spoken at madrasas. Our team is invited. We are in many, many Islamic countries. We go there and we truthfully but cordially engage them uh, with students, with faculty. I speak very respectfully, but I ask hard questions because they ask me hard questions. America will never force religion down your throat. If it does, it is in violation of its own constitution. That's why I think a theocracy is not what we need. 
We need the freedom for the Christian to be a Christian. My question to the academy is, why do you allow the legis legitimation of any other, uh, legitimizing any other belief system, but you delegitimize Christianity on the campus? That is a prejudice. To all of you who come for this evening, I want to say thanks so much for being part of it and for encouraging us. Please do pray for us. We've got several major events along the way. Let me just close with this thought and then with a time of prayer, just to close the meeting in prayer. I've been sitting here thinking, you know, here we're in Atlanta. We know the names of our streets, the speech tree something somewhere, you know. <laughs> You go to Washington and you're talking about Pennsylvania Avenue. You go to New York, it's Fifth Avenue. You go somewhere else, it's bound to be a main street. These names, we walk across and we see them. And we think about America. It's in these homes and on these streets that America lives. And it's a huge moment of opportunity. As dark as it may seem, there are many, many bright things happening. Believe me, many bright things in political corners and so on. You know, he holds the heart of the king in his hand. The nations are a drop in a bucket. God can well do without any one of these nations, but he has chosen to shed his grace on this nation for a particular time, for a particular purpose. When I was in Damascus, Syria, recently, the chief of one of the major agencies was not a Christian, welcomed me, sat me down for an hour, and told me they'd welcome me back and wanted me to have clear, top clearance to come and speak there any time. His beads in his hand, he leans forward and he said, this is where it all began, you know. When a man was put in a basket and lowered over a wall, this is where it all began. I said, well, it actually began a little down the road here, but the man in the basket was put in and then up the road went and helped change the world. Jesus had a team of bungling, stumbling misfits. I don't know if I would ever have hired Peter in my organization. <laughs> and as for the sons of thunder, we have a lot of them in organizations. Each boy wants the right hand. And yet, they conquered the known world of their time. He has chosen the weak of this world to confound the wise. We know the last chapter, and we know every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One of my heroes was a man by the name of Francis Thompson. He was a genius, but he got onto drugs. Three attempts at Oxford University, he failed. Their father never knew where he was. He was roaming the streets of London in two places, Charing Cross to buy his drugs, River Thames, where he'd cover himself with his dirty raincoat and go to sleep at night. In the winter cold of London as well. He'd go to the dustbins and find newspapers and write letters to the editor, and the editor would write back, write an article and say, there's a greater than Milton living among us, but there's no return address. Charing Cross, River Thames. Charing Cross, River Thames. He read the Bible came to Jacob's story. God brought him to his knees, and he wrote these words. O world invisible, we view thee. O world intangible, we touch thee. O world unknowable, we know thee. Inapprehensible, we clutch thee. Does a fish soar to find the ocean? An eagle plunge to find the air? Do we ask of the stars in motion if they have rumor of thee there? Not whether wheeling systems darken, or our benumbed conceiving sores, the drift of pinions would we hearken, beats on our own clay-shuttered doors. The angels keep their ancient places, touch but a stone and start a wing. Tis ye, tis your estranged faces, that amiss the many splendored thing. But when so sad, thou canst not sadder, crying upon thy so sore loss, shall shine the traffic of Jacob's ladder, pitched between heaven and Charing Cross. Yea, in the night, my soul, my daughter, cry clutching heaven by the hems. Lo, Christ walking on the water, not of Gennesaret, but Thames.
He walks Peach Street, Peach Tree Street. He walks Pennsylvania Avenue. He walks on State Bridge Road. He walks on Fifth Avenue. He's not far. His word abides forever. The gospel of Christ through the cross is the only hope for your forgiveness. You've been watching Let My People Think with Dr. Ravi Zacharias. We're grateful for your prayers and financial support. If you'd like to know more about this ministry or would like to donate to our efforts, you can call us at 1-800-448-6766 or visit us online at www.rzim.org. You can also stay connected to RZIM through Twitter and Facebook. Our mailing address is RZIM, Post Office Box 921-939, Norcross, Georgia, 30010. The mission of Ravi Zacharias International Ministries is really to reach the thinker and the skeptic, to answer the questions, and do evangelism undergirded by apologetics in clearing all of the obstacles that stand in the way so that the questioner can take a direct look at the cross of Jesus Christ. We put it simply, it is to help the thinker to believe and the believer to think. The fivefold trust of RZIM has always been first and foremost evangelism. We do evangelism undergirded by apologetics. We are involved in training people where they are and uh, within the church and training our young to be able to answer the questions that are being asked of them and then spiritual disciplines because we never want to forget the heart that has to be touched and reached. So we've got evangelism, apologetics, training and spiritual disciplines. But there is a fifth very important component. Wellspring International is the humanitarian arm of our ZIM, which is apologetics with a touch. These five components of evangelism, apologetics, training, spiritual disciplines and the humanitarian need. These are the issues that really carry us into various settings. Next time on Let My People Think. This combination of grace Let My People Think is a listener-supported television ministry and is furnished by Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia.